and I'm not quitting my day job. Welcome back to the shop, guys. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the notifications, bell, button, whatever they call that. And today, we are going to forge a knife out of a ball bearing. This is an inch and a half steel ball bearing that I purchased off of eBay, actually. And it is 5200 steel, as most ball bearings intended for use uh, in machinery are. And so, with a working with a sphere, you have uh, the initial problem of how to hold on to it. And I elected to weld a half-inch mild steel rod to the to the bearing, and uh, that worked out quite well. Um, you could also try to use tongs, I suppose, until you get it smashed flat enough to hold on to, but I don't think that's a very good way to do it. So I did it this way. If you don't have a welder to do what I'm doing here, um, you know, you can go to Harbor Freight and get a nice little arc welder for 150 bucks, which is exactly what mine is. My more expensive one had gone out. This is a year or two ago, and this is right before I was trying to build my forging press. So my entire forging press and everything since then has been welded with that little Harbor Freight welder. It works great. So I started out with the eight pound sledge on, on the bearing here, just because it's fun to smash. It's kind of like when you're making uh, cookies, you know, you roll it up into a ball and then you smash it flat. Same thing, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't uh, forge too long with the, with the heavy hammer, the, the power hammer. That's my only power hammer, but it is nice to, it is fun to, to hammer that. Actually, a, a five or six pound hammer would be about, would be good. Eight's a little heavy. My other one's only four pounds. So 50 to 100 steel forges quite easily if it's forged at the proper temperature. And you can, you can start to feel it stiffen up a little bit as the temperature drops. And you don't want to forge it down at the lower temperatures. It's got 1% uh, carbon in it and 1.5% chromium. So with that high carbon and that alloy content, it's, it can be like any steel that's similar. It can be more susceptible to damage uh, at lower forging temperatures, unlike something like 1080 or 1075, which is very forgiving. So the craziest thing about this build, of course, is the state or the shape of the steel when I got it. Um, there's really nothing crazy about using this particular steel. And I, I did purchase these bearings, so these so I know what they are. It's not. Uh, it's not like I'm guessing. So, you know, it's. Uh, you can go make a knife out of all kinds of stuff, but uh, the problem you're gonna have to deal with is, you know, figuring out what it is you're working with, you know, and therefore how to heat treat it and so forth. And so, it's kind of a neat project here, but I'm not gambling on the uh, quality of the finished product like you could otherwise be doing. So I've got the the bearing uh, drawn out to uh, I'd say about three eighths by three quarter inches. Now I'm hand forging the blade, and I start by forging down the tip so that I can uh, form that, and then begin to hammer in the bevel. So I'm kind of guessing as to how big of a knife I can make. My goal here is to make the biggest knife that I can make out of this piece of steel. And in hindsight, I could have gone a little bigger, um, but I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sure exactly how much steel this was or what this was going to end up looking like. And this is an inch and a half ball bearing. And I, I think it's safe to say that it's a deceptively uh, large amount of steel compared to what you might think. And so the knife that ended up with is, is a decent little size. Like I say, I could have I could have gone a little um, bigger. I could have uh, tapered the tang down a little more and stuff like that. But we got pretty close to using up, you know, using the all of the material efficiently. So not a huge deal there. I'm just uh, forging out the tang a little more, flattening it flattening it out, and uh, putting some slight contour in it or curves in it for comfortable um, use. We'll go ahead and refine the blade shape a little bit here. 
So this is a blade shape that I've um, made a few knives in, or something similar to this anyway, but it's kind of a miniature, almost a miniature uh, Bowie knife style, you could say. It's got a clip point to it. Um, another significant feature is that the edge is continuously curved throughout the length of the blade. And I find that to be an efficient, uh, an efficient blade design for cutting because it allows you to continuously draw the uh, the edge through whenever you're cutting, if if you want to or if need be. Which is a did I say efficient yet? <laughs> did I, I think I said that a couple times. So just refining the blade shape here. And one thing about 5200 steel is it was originally developed for bearings and so it's been around for over a hundred years and some of the uh, characteristics that you want in a bearing is strength and so in other words it's not going to be crushed it won't won't uh, deform or squish and then you also want want some abrasion resistance you know as that bearing whether it's a ball bearing or a roller bearing is you know continuously rolling over other surfaces, other steel surfaces, you want it to be able to maintain its um, dimensions as mu as long as possible. And so those are a couple of characteristics, and uh, those both of those characteristics are desirable for most knives. Uh, the the biggest difference between the application of bearings and the application of nut for knives in this particular steel 5200, I think, would probably be the heat treatment of it. And um, if you if you watch uh, a previous video where I forged a, a different knife out of some 5200, I go into depth uh, at length about the heat treatment process, so I won't do that here. But suffice to say, you don't want to heat treat it exactly the same way as you would for a ball bearing. Anyway, so getting the blade here uh, forged in, and, and something else I was going to mention, one thing I haven't quite dialed in yet is sort of how... Um, how close to finished dimensions I can actually forge this without or and still leave enough material to grind off to allow for the decarburization, the decarb layer. And you know, every steel is going to decarb as you're forging it, which basically means the outer layer of of carbon is has been cooked out of the steel. And you want to be able to grind that off in your final product, at least specifically near the edge. And uh, different steels will decarburize to a different level and I, I haven't f this is I think the uh, maybe the third knife uh, I forged maybe the second or third knife I can't remember now that I forged out of 5200 and so I'm still kind of dialing that in but it doesn't the, the decarb is not nearly as bad as like 80 CRV2 which is probably the worst steel for that that I've used so it's not too bad so all that to say you can forge it pretty close to your um, finished dimensions and then following all of the uh, normalizing cycles and heat treatment, the decarb layer isn't too terrible from what I found. So what I was doing there is just basically trying to spheridize or soften the, uh, the tang on the knife. And that is where you heat it up to a dull red uh, below austenizing temperature. You don't want to go, you don't want to turn it to austenite because then it'll turn into perlite, which is not what you want. And you can see here that um, I was mostly successful at that. I like got a few uh, squeaks on the uh, drill bit here going through the end of the tang and then up closer to the blade it uh, worked out real well. But if you notice the temperature of the steel and it's kind of hard to judge in the in the camera because it shows it, uh, it the camera always shows it uh, hotter than it really is uh, but you can see the difference in, in uh, color and so up closer to the blade is where the the spheridizing actually worked well and I didn't, I didn't get the end of the tang quite hot enough to effectively spheridize that. But that's where uh, you heat it up to that temperature, about 1350, and it uh, segregates, balls up all the carbides, or all the carbon into um, carbides in the steel, and basically gets them out of the way of, you know, your ability to machine. It doesn't, uh, it's not uh, integrated into the matrix of the steel to provide the strength uh, that uh, and hardness so makes it a lot easier to machine or drill through so what am I doing here well uh, as part of my continued uh, journey into 5200 steel 
I went ahead and purchased some AAA quench oil. And I'll just say off right off the bat here as a side note, if you're if you're into making knives or you're getting into making knives, purchasing a quality quench oil that's designed for the steel that you're working with is probably the single most one of the single most uh, uh, best investments that you can make if you're planning on actually making more than just a couple knives. And so I could go into length about that, but I won't do that here. But anyway, this is a quench tank for my new quench oil. I have the Parks 50 and the other and the other uh, steel container. So um, 52100 steel with the one and a half percent chromium in it is a slow slow enough hardening steel as to be able to use um, an oil that is a fast oil instead of a, a very fast oil. Triple A quench oil is a nine to eleven second oil. Parks 50 is a 7 to 9 second oil, which is the fastest that I'm aware of. It was originally developed to uh, quench as quickly as water initially, and then it's an engineered oil, so as once you drop below a certain temperature, it slows down. So the AAA is not, is not as fast, but it is, it is sufficiently fast of a quench oil to properly harden uh, 5200. And if you watch my previous video on 5200, um, I mentioned something that I don't think was entirely correct, um, and that is that you shouldn't quench it in an 11 second oil. Um, actually, that should be fine. But I didn't. I didn't want to use. I wanted to use the best oil that I could, so I got this uh, AAA. And from what I understand, that is the best oil you can use for 5200. You can also quench it in Parks 50, but I'm trying to dial everything in here in a manner that's going to be the best uh, for this for this steel. I'm trying to get this uh, quench tank finished up before I actually have to quench this blade here. Uh, the inside was all rusty so I cleaned that all out and everything. And I'm running the normalizing cycle or the normalizing cycle and then uh, grain refinement cycles on the blade in the meantime. So I normalized it at 1625 and held that temperature for 20 minutes. Now early on, when I first started making knives, I think as a lot of people do, I was real concerned about uh, grain size and keeping that as small as possible. And the more I learned, the more research I have done, learning that uh, grain size is, small grain size is good, but you can go too far to a point where you, have, you could have a super fine grain size, but then you end up losing characteristics such as abrasion resistance and stuff like that because you don't have the amount of carbon in solution that you need. And so the key to that really is uh, the balance between time and temperature. And if you get your blade too hot at certain points in the process, that is going to be much worse than keeping the blade at a slightly lower temperature for a longer period of time. That's going to be the best uh, solution. So when you have when you're working with steel like 5200, you're kind of walking the the balance between um, getting enough enough carbon into solution but not too much so after normalizing um because well, what i'm trying to say is uh, with the chromium in there that slows things down and so you have to hold things at a longer period of time but if you go too to too high of a temperature then you're going to run the risk of uh, somewhat grain enlargement and then too much carbon into solution and so forth anyway Refining it at uh, 1500 and then 1450 and then austenizing at 1475 for 20 minutes and then into the quench Everything looks good And one thing about 5200 is you do have quite a window of opportunity to to straighten it and to tweak it a little bit as it cools down in temperature which is why I like to pull it out of the quench before it's completely, you know, down to ambient temperature, since that is not necessary anyway and creates more stress. All right, so we have a couple of temper tempering cycles on it as per usual. And now it's time to uh, start grinding on it. I haven't done any grinding on it so far. Um, completely forged to shape and the bevel's forged in. And I mentioned the decarburization layer earlier, 
And this is where you get to kind of see how deep that goes because as you're grinding, uh, especially grinding the bevels, you can really feel, you know, um, where the softer steel is because the outer layer, of course, is going to be a, a low carbon or, you know, very low carbon steel. And so once you cut through that and then get to the, uh, the good steel and underneath that, you can really feel the difference when you're grinding. So you always want to make sure that you grind a, an appropriate layer off of the edge of the blade specifically where you're going to actually put the, put the edge on so that you're down to good steel. So here I'm using a, a ceramic uh, abrasive belt, granny belt from Empire Abrasives. This is the 40 grit. And these are the, the best belts that I have used for actually grinding, taking material off. And, you know, whether you're grinding a, a bevel or profile or whatever. But the thing that, um, where that really comes into play here is, so this, this blade is completely heat treated right here. And you can see me dipping it in water. And so it's really important, obviously, to keep that blade from overheating particularly past whatever temperature that you tempered it at. That's one reason why I grind without gloves and I'm continually feeling the temperature. Uh, but the reason I bring that up is because having a grinding belt that will uh, remove material as efficiently as possible uh, keeps the heat down, which is really a good, which is a good thing and uh, helps to keep that blade from overheating um, at all. And so these belts from Empire Abrasives are the best, the best that I've used at that. They, they work really well. And further, <clears throat> when you're grinding on a fully heat treated blade, uh, there's a lot of belts out there that I have tried before and used before a lot that just don't remove material um, like these do. So um, yeah, so there's a, there's a link in the video description to Empire Braces. If you click on that, uh, that's my affiliate link. It helps the channel out and you can use the uh, code Fire Creek for 10% off at Empire Braces, and that also helps the channel out too, so I really appreciate that. So we've got this, uh, this ground down to final dimensions, minus the hand sanding here. And uh, it, it turned out good. I, I took out, like I said, I kind of took off more material than I should have had to, but I, like I said, I didn't really when I was forging it, I didn't exactly know kind of where, how far I could forge things initially. And so when I kind of put in the, the dimensions of the blade, I, I should have made things a little longer, thinner, whatever. Point is, is that I ground off a little more material than, than you might typically have to if you understand where you're forging to. But that's better than having not enough material and ending up with too thin of a blade or something like that. But it's got a nice distal taper in there. Should be a great little blade. This is a piece of uh, walnut wood that I'm going to use uh, to make the handles out of. And it's a piece of scrap wood, essentially, from a fellow that uh, made kitchen utensils out of all kinds of wood. And uh, the farmer's market that we used to go to, you know, he would have, like I said, all, all kinds of different woods. But he gave me these pieces. And uh, it's kind of amazing what you can pull a knife handle out of if you're uh, paying attention. And so that little chunk there, that'll be good for several more knives. I actually originally drilled these handle pinholes for uh, 5 30 seconds, and that is not a 5 30 seconds drill bit because halfway through I decided to use uh, my loveless bolts on the handle instead of the 5 30 second pin. So you can hear it kind of squeaking as it goes through the uh, tang. It's because it's cutting a little more steel, and the steel is. A little bit hard so made it through though i think that speaking of decarburization levels that the tiny or the amount of decarburization level inside that hole uh inside the holes is what allows that bigger drill bit to actually go through the the heat treated tang so decarburization isn't always bad so getting the handle skills Epoxied and secured with these bolts, handle bolts here, loveless bolts. One of my favorite uh, handle fastening devices. You know, quite frankly, you know, the, the full tang is a pretty simple design. And here we are with the epoxy cured several hours later, sometime later, shaping the handle up. But uh, the full tang design, as simple as it is, 
you know, it's really the strongest uh, design of knife there is and one of the simplest, it just works, it just works really well. Especially if you're gonna make a knife that's actually intended for use, which is what I enjoy doing. So, get this handle shaped up here. The walnut works pretty easily on the, on the belt sander, just keeping an eye on uh, symmetry and, uh, and all that kind of stuff here. Get a little hand sand. And this, uh, style of hand, this style of handle here is kind of a modified um, brooms, brooms, I think it's been referred to as like a broomstick handle before. It's not round though, it's more of an oval. But it's similar to like the old Kephart uh, knife handles, only it's got a bit of a curve to it. Anyway, it fits really well in the hand. It's, it's secure and comfortable. And those are, that's what you want in a, uh, a using knife. So I like, I like how it turned out. I'm kind of thinking about making more of these knives. As kind of as a design that I'll be repeating. We'll see what happens. But there's the knife. And there's the there's the ball bearing one just like it that it came from. I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. And I will be doing some testing on this knife with a cardboard cut test and stuff like that. And that'll be a separate video. So be sure to stay tuned for that. But anyway, I appreciate you guys coming along on this build. Hopefully this helps out helps you out in your shop. And uh, we will see you on the next video.